the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, Diesel as a German Solution, Arsenal, Largest Custom Loadout, and Metal Beasts, Forgotten Flying Cannon. In the hangars of many players deep beneath the dust and spare parts, one can find quite a number of enjoyable low-tier vehicles. We're continuing our search for such unfairly forgotten machines, and today's highlight is a rare visitor that both new and veteran War Thunder players might like. Please welcome a German Rank 1 fighter, the Heinkel 112A0. This machine is propelled by a liquid-cooled inline 12-cylinder engine. Self-sealing fuel tanks are found in the fuselage and the wing roots. Its armament is a single 20mm engine cannon with 100 rounds of ammo. We'd like to start by discussing the weaponry. Yes, there's only one barrel, but in this case, it's quality over quantity. This 20mm cannon, the MGC-30L, is unique in War Thunder. The main highlight of this gun is excellent ballistics, something you'd never expect from early German 20mm guns. An ammo pool of 100 rounds might seem too shallow at first, but with a modest rate of fire, it can last you an entire battle. This weapon is the main thing that piqued our interest towards the aircraft. It might become a great way to practice shooting in air combat for beginners while also providing a great experience for both new and veteran players alike. Here's what a typical battle looks like. Take off and start climbing towards the enemy. The best speed here is around 220 to 230 kilometers an hour. As a rule of thumb, you can sustain that at an angle of around 15 degrees. As soon as you spot your first contacts, level the aircraft and start gaining speed. Your best choices are frontal and energy attacks. Thanks to this amazing autocannon mounted in the engine hub, you can deliver accurate fire even a kilometer away, while most of your opponents will have to fly closer. If your enemy is still flying after the first attack, just break away, make a safe turn, and try another time. The Heinkel can even dogfight some monoplane fighters, like the American P-36, using its multi-mode flaps. It might sound surprising to all you top-tier vets, but at rank 1, some planes don't even have flaps. This aircraft can also be useful in mixed battles. It doesn't have any suspended armament, sure, but the cannon is still good. Its armor-piercing rounds can penetrate up to 37 millimeters of steel. At this battle rating, it's enough for most enemy tanks. The Heinkel 112 is an extremely simple yet promising machine. Maybe it's time you dusted it off, fueled it, and sent it to battle. In one of our previous episodes, we started telling you about German tank engines. Back in the mid-1930s, Maybach basically monopolized the development of engines for military trucks and tanks. At first, it presented no concern, but with the outbreak of the war, it led to some serious issues. Despite Maybach being the largest European engine manufacturer, it still couldn't meet the demand. And what if the factories got bombed? No vehicles would be made at all. In 1942, the Germans recognized the issue and tried to add some Ordnung. Maybach commissioned eight more companies to work on engine assembly. At the same time, they had an idea to standardize the line. They wanted all new engines to have pistons of the same diameter and stroke length. Need a small engine? Get four cylinders in line. Need a strong engine? Get the same cylinders and place them into a V12. It was a good idea that came too late. Maybach was already having issues launching new engines with light crankcases. Developing and designing another new line was certainly beyond possible. Meanwhile, they had an even more extreme plan. Switch to air-cooled diesels. This idea wasn't as crazy as it might seem at first. The Germans were using coal to make gasoline, diesel, and even lubricants. In 1942, they thought they'd be able to mass-produce synthetic diesel. Moreover, despite the widespread belief, the Wehrmacht had never limited itself to gasoline only. The Germans spent the entire war fueling their trucks with diesel. Why not switch tanks to it too? 
Besides, the Germans were even producing powerful aircraft diesel engines, and that task was much harder than tank engines. Air cooling, on the other hand, was a subject of long, heated arguments. The Germans fought in all kinds of climates, from the sands of Africa to the frosts of the Soviet Union. In the former, the radiators almost boiled, while in the latter, they often froze solid. Air-cooled engines had no such issues, but machining the cylinders for them took more effort and resources. The Maybach company never made air-cooled engines, while Porsche engineers had a great deal of experience. They managed to design an air-cooled diesel engine for the King Tiger. It had an X shape, which allowed the engineers to fit no less than 16 cylinders in the short compartment. For the time, it was an advanced turbocharged engine with 750 horsepower. They even managed to install one such engine into a Tiger and made a few test runs. But this unique SPG was soon captured by the Soviet Army. Unfortunately, it was lost later. Smaller diesels were borrowed from the Tatra heavy trucks. The Hetzer was supposed to have an 8-cylinder engine with 180 horsepower. A more powerful V12 with 220 horsepower found its way into 8-wheel armored cars. And after the war, the Czechs put it onto their half-track IFVs. So, could the Germans make a complete switch to diesel engines? Let's imagine that the Stug 3, the Panzer IV, and other vehicles with old chassis were discontinued. What would we have left? The Hetzer, the Panther, the King Tiger, an IFV, and an eight-wheeled armored car. Those already had suitable air-cooled diesels. Not a bad set, but there's one problem here. The Germans needed tens of thousands of engines, yet they had nowhere to make them. Rebuilding factories was too complicated, and new ones were few and far between. The Germans started the war with a whole zoo of Maybach engines, and lost it with the same zoo. It was simply too late to change anything. In the last episodes of Arsenal, we discussed the best choice for top attack jets. How about prop aircraft? After multiple requests in the comments, today we'd like to focus on the most advanced Sky Raider, also known as the record holder for the number of hardpoints in War Thunder, the A1H. If there's a plane that makes players struggle with choice, it's this one. You can easily run into the load limit while picking your weapons here. Still, even if you don't cross the line, a Sky Raider loaded up to the brim is far from enjoyable in flight. Let's start with the bombs. There are no less than seven types, and it's easy to get lost. We'll start by saying that full 250 and 500 pound loads are useless. You can take a large number of smaller calibers, but those aren't that handy against tanks. Moreover, dropping them all will take a long time which increases your chances of seeing the hangar screen prematurely. We recommend you go for more reliable calibers as your main ones, like 750 or 1,000 pounds. You can take up to three bombs of each. They don't cost that much, they're dropped one by one, and they don't overload the plane. In addition to the main three, you can take some 500-pound M64 bombs. These have more explosives than the Mark 82. The plane can fit up to eight of them, but you shouldn't be chasing quantity. It might be wiser to create a few versatile sets and increase your load gradually, so that it doesn't make assault difficult. The Sky Raider has more expensive 2,000-pound bombs, but those have more flaws than just the cost. The wing ones can only be released in pairs, which reduces your number of drops. The central one is usually part of a mixed set, and that's inconvenient. You'll have to increase fuse time, which makes smaller calibers harder to use. This American aircraft has quite a few rockets as well, but we believe the ultimate choice is the large caliber Zuni. They're accurate, powerful, and come in decent numbers. They're also extra handy against open-top vehicles like the anti-aircraft ones, since they don't need a direct hit. Large caliber rockets are also pretty good against tanks, so if you want to put some additional weapons onto your wing hardpoints, take a look at the Zuni. The Sky Raider also has some other great sets. For instance, you can use eight miniguns for air battles. They won't turn this plane into a good fighter, but anyone who dares attack the helpless strike aircraft from the front will be in for a huge surprise. And of course, we can't help but mention the unique ceramic ordnance. You can carry it as a talisman, 
Use it as an intimidation tactic, suppress enemy morale, or simply keep it in a dry, cool place away from children. It's up to you. Well, now it's time for us to answer some of the questions you left in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Begula. What's the plane that holds the most air-to-air -air missiles? Hi, Begula. We don't have a clear record for now because multiple planes can carry up to eight air-to-air -air missiles. Kim Jong-un asks, so the Black Knight is better? Because even though it's slow, it has the APS and can do hull down anyways. Greetings, Supreme Leader. The Black Knight's APS is a great option, no doubt, but we believe a strong engine is more beneficial, so we'd pick the 2E as the best model right now. Another question comes from Loren. Which is better, the Panzer II or the Panzer III-E? Hey Loren, their tactics are similar, so it's more about your personal armament preference. The 37mm cannon one-shots enemies with its capped round more often, while the 20mm autocannon can attack multiple enemies at once. Hardly monetizable memes, right? Why was the nose section of the Heinkel 111 made asymmetrically? Hi there! You can spot this design solution on many planes and helicopters. It's usually done to compensate for the propeller's torque reaction. And the last comment for today was written by Panini. Am I the only one hearing German? Why is everyone commenting in English like they understand something? I'm so confused! Hello, Panini. The shooting range has recently added German dubbing. You can choose the track you want in the player settings. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT, or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to put a freshener into your privy if you want to drop it with style. Leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.